Well, folks, we're, we're going to take about 40 minutes this evening and explore what I think is one of the most important concepts to come around in the area of employment since that venerable and great good idea of supported employment, which arose back in the mid-80s. Uh, since that time, uh, tens of thousands of people who were perceived not to be able to work uh, have gained employment through supported employment. However, one of the things we noticed was uh, a, uh, a barrier that seemed to begin to be created. And, and supported employment for a number of reasons uh, tended not to live up to completely to the promise of employment for all, which uh, we're hearing more and more as a, uh, as a concept that uh, will define the future of disability, I believe. And what was necessary was to begin to look beyond supported employment uh, to the very employment relationship itself, and thus emerged customized employment. I'm going to talk to you about that and some of the promises that, uh, that are possible through customized employment. I'll talk to you about the official definition, uh, give you a, a, a lot of examples, and then, as Beth said, also give you time uh, to type in some questions that I'll try to answer as best I can uh, in the time that we have this evening. So, you know, the, the question is, so many people with significant disabilities uh, have a dream of employment. And for so many people, uh, employment, even at the best, has been uh, that kind of happenstance, uh, entry level of the service industry kind of job. When a lot of particularly young people, and one of the things I'm doing in this particular webinar tonight uh, is focusing on people in the transition age frame. Uh, and uh, when the young people are in that uh, situation and work kind of hits them in the face many times with the reality of it's hard. Uh, if, if, you're, if an employer is going to pay you and you're expected to do all of the job, it's really hard. And if you find yourself uh, at, the, at the very entry level of the service industry, and it looks like there's really no way out into any kind of career environment, uh, anything beyond that. What you find too often is rapid turnover for your coworkers, that ideal supervisor leaving just when everything seemed fine, and also having to realize that you know there's hardly anything about this job that has anything to do with who I am. Well, what if we could make all of that different? You know, what if we could really have employment be about who people are. And I think, I think this is a promise we should try to do for all our youth, and, and indeed for all of us, but we're focusing on youth tonight. So regardless of whether a young person has a disability or, or not, employment should reference who they are, and too often it just referenced what we could get for them. And uh, so what I'm going to do is to, is to try to deal with this issue of, well, how can we get a good job in a career setting? And, and just briefly, I, I got to meet Ethan. This is a young man from the greater Salt Lake area when he was still in school. And Ethan had a lot going on in his life, but the likelihood of a working life in a job that fit who he was did not seem too hopeful. Uh, his parents were were both optimistic about his skills, but realizing that not everyone in the system saw Ethan the same way that they did. And, uh, and frankly, th there was a great deal of concern, and I'm sure many of you who are parents share that same concern uh, who are listening tonight. And I, I think Ethan is the kind of young man who, who in typical supported employment would have ended up at the entry level of the service industry with the job coach pretty well attached to his right or left side uh, as he either bus tables or operated a dishwasher or all the other things that has comprised employment for too many of the people that we work with. 
And it's not that those jobs are somehow bad jobs, but the circumstance, the context is one of the toughest places to work in our society. I think of the entry level of the service industry like playing in the paint in basketball. If you stand around, you're going to get knocked down. People move in and out all the time. It's constant movement. And that doesn't always work for people with more significant disabilities. Well, what if you started instead with who is Ethan and use the process of discovery to be the guide and really committed to following that? Well, one of the things we found about this young man is he truly loves sports. Uh, I remember walking into his bedroom uh, with him guiding me in and his mom right there at the door, kind of wondering why would this guy want to know about where my son lives most of his life in his bedroom. Well, his room was plastered with sports memorabilia, mostly University of Utah Utes, so the room was, was almost all red. But then uh, interspersed throughout all the red um, was a very interesting thing from my perspective was black and gold. And he happened to be a New Orleans Saints fan. And I loved the guy immediately. You know, it was like uh, I live on the Gulf Coast and the Saints are our team. And, um, and it was just clear this is a guy who, who would just love to have something to do with sports. And as it turned out, um, Ethan works for the University of Utah Athletic Department. He prepares all of the, um, the equipment uh, uh, packages, I guess you could say, the baggage that, that 13 different sports teams take on the road. He has full access to the basketball court, the football stadium. Uh, he can get in when his parents cannot get in. He works, he's uh, supported 100% by coworkers. Uh, he's had a job coach, but the role of the job coach was not to stay, but to get him going. And, you know, I often say, although he does actually take a bus to work, he really floats to work every day. It just feels like, you mean they pay me to do this? And as we look forward, you know that uh, people have different interests. And if we're, to me, career is one of the most difficult terms to, to really functionally define in our society. Most of us equate career with high responsibility, uh, high levels of pay, requiring credentials. But what if career was about working in a place where people wanted to work there for their life work. And your coworkers were likely to be people that you worked around. And the tasks that you do were tasks that reflect what you would like to do. Well, for James, it took a while for him to figure that out. And one of the things that we're finding in innovations in customized employment is the same thing that so many of our youth are using. Indeed, my daughter with no disability at all had a number of paid internships that help her get her head around what would really work for her. And so James had three. They were paid at minimum wage, and it's resulted in him working in, of all places, a granite fabrication shop. He actually fabricates granite that will be placed on, on countertops in very, very fine homes. And for him, a, a man in special education, a man who was going to, if he worked at all, was going to be at the entry level of the service industry, now has a career job. James has also bought his own home. Uh, the people at the cabinet shop are, are helping him make sure he has granite cabinet uh, countertops, although his parents don't have any such thing. And, and he's really on the way to a real working life in a career context. And, and that's very interesting because as the people that, that we work with and the people who are in your families, or I know some of you are, are special ed teachers, maybe some VR counselors out there, if we can think about really having the person guide us and uh, accepting the direction of discovery is one of the most important aspects of customized employment. Uh, we really embrace the individual as the guide, not that we start with just saying to a person, tell me what you want to do, because many times people simply don't know. But we look at what works in their lives, what their intrinsic interests are, what their unique skills are. 
And when we find that, we can find people in very sophisticated settings doing things that that aren't just the typical thing. Too often, if a person with a significant disability is going to work around children, at best they're cleaning up after them. But what about the opportunity to actually teach tasks part of that's part of a, a school curriculum for young children? And if the individual has specific skills, and if we can match those to needs of the setting, then customized employment can result in real opportunity, even though the credential threshold would not be met, the educational threshold would not be met. So what makes this possible? Well, you know, supported employment back in the mid 80s, I was around, I'm, I'm a pretty old guy, and, and it was around when supported employment began. And if, even though we didn't have the internet in those days, if we had, we would say supported employment went viral. In just a couple of years, it burst from not even being named. I first heard the term supported employment in 1983 at a TASH conference in Denver. Uh, by 1984, it was in federal statute in the first DD Act. By 1986, it was in the VR Act of 1986. Well, we began to understand the need for customizing the relationship as early as 1988, but it took until 2014 to actually get the concept into federal statute, but it happened. Uh, when President Obama signed the Work Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, thus amending the VR Act, the Rehab Act, a new definition was in that act for customized employment. And while we're still waiting on final regulations, and those are important, uh, we now have federal definitions that really help us to back this up. And this page references the, as I've taken this language right out of the uh, federal register that announced uh, the statute uh, to the country. And let's, I'm going to read through it. it it'll help, uh, it, and I will apologize first for bureaucratic syntax. It's, it's pretty weird language, but, um, but nonetheless, it, it makes sense when you really think about it. Customized employment means competitive, integrated employment for an individual with a significant disability. There's some important words there. Competitive is really used euphemistically here, meaning community employment. It's integrated means that it's not in a sheltered workshop or a work crew or an enclave. It's one person, one job. Uh, and it's for a person with a significant disability. And that, those are all important concepts. It's based on an individualized determination of the strengths, needs, and interests of the individual with a significant disability. This is important because even though we weren't able to get the word discovery in the act, that looking at the strengths, needs, and interests, a determination, is not a comparative assessment. It should not be. And you should advocate strongly to avoid having your family members tested in a way that they have to pass muster. This does not require that. Uh, nor does the Rehab Act in general, by the way. It has not for well over uh, 20 years, close to 25 years at the uh, 1992 reauthorizations. Rehab no longer is supposed to evaluate, to assess, to determine likelihood of benefit. And in fact, what they're supposed to do, according to the law, is generally presume that a person can benefit. But then the definition goes on, and it's designed to meet the specific abilities of the, of the person, our family members, your students, and also business needs of the employer. And it's carried out through a, a number of, of strategies. Now, again, when you get something through Congress, it's always a compromise. And, and, it's, and there's some things that you just scratch your head and you wonder, well, I'm not sure what Congress means. And number A, job exploration by the individual. I have to tell you, I have no idea what the framers meant, the people who passed that. However, under B, it's very important. Working with an employer to facilitate placement, including customizing a job description based on current employer needs 
or on previously unidentified and unmet employer needs. Folks, if you're customizing, you're not going after a job opening. You're not going after a job title. You look at the specific ability of the individual and specific needs of the employer and negotiation occurs. This is requiring new skills on the part of service providers or if families get involved for families. Now maybe what Congress meant in Part A is they presume that an individual can go out and represent themselves. Well, let's think about that for a second. The brightest and best in our uh, culture use representatives to make deals. You don't find sports figures, uh, entertainment figures, CEOs of, of companies making their own deals. They almost always use representatives. And uh, that's where, that's why A is confusing. I do not recommend, uh, I, I wouldn't, on my, my own behalf, try to negotiate a customized job. I would want a representative to do it. And here, Congress is actually building that in. Also, we develop a set of job duties, a work schedule, a job arrangement that basically what, what this is saying is it meets the needs of the person, but it's negotiated. This is not a right this is a negotiation. And actually employers who have closed the door based on fear around the ADA open their doors around negotiation. And again, representation by a professional chosen by the individual or if it works, self-representation in working with an employer to facilitate placement. So if you're wondering, uh, does someone have a right to a representative. Well, this, right, this is the statute. This is the law of the United States. And then if supported employment services are needed, see, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Supported employment is basically a post-employment service. Customized employment stipulates the job relationship, the employment relationship between the individual and an employer. That's the new aspect. That's the distinction of customized employment. And it really gets down to unbundling tasks from job descriptions and creating a level of flexibility that helps deal with the impact of disability in the lives of people with significant disabilities. And just, I mean, everyone on this call knows this. I mean, we know we work with people who struggle to do things exactly the same way as everybody else. In fact, I think everybody struggles to do things the way that everybody does it. It's, a, it's kind of a myth. We put it out there, and too often the folks that we work with get exposed before others of not being able to do everything that was expected, and when in fact very, very few people do everything that's expected. So this unbundling is, is at the base of good customized employment. And the interesting thing is employers are not pushing back. We've been doing this under the radar for, for well over a decade, almost two decades. And we have significant uh, information that indicates employers understand when we make the case for customized employment. On our side of the issue, you don't just go out and just say, okay, I'm going to customize. Let me see if I can go to, an go to an employer and see, are you willing to negotiate? In fact, what we owe employers is the implementation of a process that when implemented has a logic that makes sense and that works. And you can think of that as the customized process. And what you see at the first step is discovery. Discovery is is a qualitative alternative to comparative assessment that you simply can't fail. With discovery, you start with an A, you end with an A, you can't fail being who you are. And for some of you who, who have family members with very significant impact of disabilities in their lives, this is one of the first times that a concept comes along that's like, this is for me, this is for my son, my daughter. And then we know how important important positive paper is. There's so much negative paper on folks with significant disabilities. 
the profile document provides an alternative to all those assessment reports that basically say, I'm sorry, your son, your daughter can't work, so we don't have to serve you. And here's all the reason, here's all the science behind it. And in fact, this qualitative approach of discovery creates or yields a profile document that's optimistic, it's narrative, and it's about what's possible. And then we have to have a plan that truly connects who the person is to possibility. Too often it breaks down here. Uh, the Rehab Act, for instance, just asks for a person to give me one vocational goal and then we're stuck with that and you've got to go get it. Now there's some workarounds, but basically in an IPE, an Individualized Plan for Employment, that's the, that's the case. So with this, we give ourselves wiggle room and that wiggle room is created by interest. We actually follow people's interest to see what their employment would look like. That's how Ethan ended up at the university in the, in the uh, athletic department rather than at the cafeteria busing tables. It makes a big difference. And also we need a complement to the profile, which we call a visual resume which puts the best of who the person is out there visually. And this is not a complex thing to develop. This can be developed by family members in uh, cooperation with service providers and even VR counselors or special ed teachers to put together a portfolio using a simple PowerPoint format of the best of who the person is. The hard thing about that is getting our head around it's okay to present a person at their best. And for any one of us who has ever developed a resume and put it in front of an employer, shame on us if we're not willing to put the best of the person forward. Because every one of our resumes only contained the best. It did not contain the worst of who we were. And then we need job development representation of the sort allowed in the definition, in the statutory language of customized employment. So that People don't have to do this themselves. The job developers need to learn a skill set for representation and negotiation. And frankly, folks, th this is one of our weak areas. People love discovery. They love, uh, to even to some degree, writing profiles. But it's not common in the field of, of uh, adult services and employment services that staff people like to go out and make job calls. And we need to get over that. Job development has got to be job one if people are going to go to work. We can't just think we do all the soft skill training and then blame the person if they don't get a job. We have to represent them and when we do, people get jobs and they hold jobs. And then for many of the folks that I think we're representing and talking about on this webinar tonight, for many of those folks, they're going to need supported employment support. And that's where, that's where the customized relationship dovetails with good supported employment. And a, an effective term of art that I'm talking about is customized supported employment. That's really what it is. Customize the relationship, support the person on the job. And again, I want to reiterate the importance of discovery in this entire concept. If, unless we really get to know the person, we're just guessing at what works for them. It's really not customized. It may be individualized, but customized is a higher order concept than individualization. And it really relates to we are being guided by, driven by the individual, their conditions for success, their interests, and their unique contributions. Those are the three main focus areas of discovery. And actually discovery creates the individual's blueprint, so to speak. We have found that these three areas, these are the distilled kind of outcomes of discovery. It's like when you're panning for gold and what's left in the bottom are those nuggets or gold dust. Well, this is what's left in the bottom of the pan in discovery. What conditions need to be in place for this person to be successful in a job? What are their interests that would guide us towards certain aspects of the job market? And what unique and specific 
contributions might they make, and they do not have to have the whole package. They can have as few as 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 little as one task to offer, and it can still work for employment. Now, on the employer side, here's the interesting thing that we're still just coming to terms with. There's a concept called unmet, unmet workplace needs. Every workplace in the world has things that need to be done that aren't getting done. Project Search, going across the country, that I have a lot of respect for. I think there are things that I would improve in Project Search, has taught us through work in hospitals and other large places that there are tasks that employers might be interested in assigning tasks from very highly paid job descriptions that could easily be done by an individual at a much lower pay grade, still at or above minimum wage. And this is not handicapped. This is a business deal. Why would an employer pay someone a high wage if someone else could do the same task at a much lower pay grade? Well, if you think about that, it makes perfect business sense. And in fact, many businesses just need a better run place, tasks that would enhance their workplace. Now here's the interesting thing. We can put these together in somewhat of an equation. If we solve for the, first, for the person first through discovery and understand their conditions for success, their interest and their contributions, then job development is an effort to solve for X. This is kind of an algebraic thing. And we're out there looking for an employers who could benefit from who the person is in areas of business. And when it's presented like this, employers respond like, this is a business deal. Yes, it is. It's a business deal. And that's extremely important to understand. We're not asking for charity, and we're not asking for a job opening at the entry level. We're asking to make a difference in a workplace and employers are willing to pay for that. That's a, that's a very powerful thing to say, and it's very true. Again, as I've made these distinctions, the custom, CE is customized employment, SE is supported employment, and the easiest way to think about a distinction of importance is they operate at opposite ends of employment service. For a person who needs a customized relationship to be successful, Customized employment starts at before a job is ever developed. It gets to know the person and then negotiates a job that fits. Supported employment happens at the employment end. That's where the person is on the job site. And oftentimes because, and we're, we're actually getting evidence-based data on this in an increasing way, because the job is well matched, the need the, for the extent of supported employment job coaching is showing that it's less. And now that's a business deal for funders. So we're really looking forward to continuing uh, the evidence-based research on blending good customized and supported employment. I would urge any of you on this call, don't let anybody try to drive a wedge trying to say to you, oh, the customized employment is not really any kind of important distinction. You know, it's just good supported employment. They don't understand the employment relationship if that's the case. What, what good employment is for people with significant disabilities is to customize the relationship in ways that the job fits and then support the person on the job using good supported employment. Then you've really got good employment all the way around. So I'm going to end up the presentation with a number of stories, uh, all of young people. And one of my favorite enduring stories is for James. And um, one of the reasons it's one of my favorite stories is James goes back pretty far into my life. I can remember my wife back in the 80s coming home from an early special ed job that she had early in her career talking about this young man with autism in her special ed class and what a hoot he was and how how interesting and sometimes sad because James spent most of his early days at school crying because he couldn't line his pencils up on his desk because his desk had no notches for his pencils to be in and they kept rolling off and he would cry and 
Teresa would try to work with him and finally she was able to requisition a desk with grooves and all of his behavioral issues went away. He was quite happy once that occurred. I found him later when he was 19 years old and another teacher, a close friend of mine, uh, was quite frustrated with this guy named James, she said. I had no idea who he was. It was the same James, now grown up. And he had lost four jobs that she had found for him. All the jobs were for pay. By the way, none of the jobs matched. And certainly his, his strong skills on organization were overlooked. And nobody even asked about his interests. They just said, well, here's it. he can do this, so let's put him in this job and that job. And the jobs she found for him weren't bad jobs. They just weren't based on James. And it wasn't until discovery. And having his father respond to the question, what does he do? And in a frustrated way, well, what he does is watches those awful cop shows on television. And, and we found out he just owns the, the family remote control. And the awful cop shows were the reality TV uh, shows that that just predominate. And and one of the things you find is, it, I mean, if, if he truly has an interest in police work, what's wrong with pursuing that? And, it, and if we said, okay, well, he would really like to be a police officer, then we've blown it because he doesn't have the credentials. I don't know of any police officer with middle of the spectrum autism uh, as a diagnosis. But I can tell you that that since about 1990, best I can tell, that's, uh, I mean, not 1990, about 2000, it's about 16 years, James has worked at our local sheriff's department in the county in which I live, Jackson County, Mississippi. Uh, and what he did at first was he organized arrest reports. So as you, one of his organization skills came in that these arrest reports were often in boxes waiting to be filed. Later, he helped a multi-jurisdictional drug task force keep up with their equipment because the guys would come in after a drug bust and drop all of their gear on the ground and for the next bust then they was it was like a circus trying to get everything together and then finally today uh, he works in the criminal investigation division again filing and uh, he works 32 hours a week he is the senior person uh, in the division and he has been through, he's on his fourth sheriff right now. Uh, and this is a man with very significant impact of autism. And he's in truly a career job. Sometimes it's hard to find what people have to offer. This is a young woman who, who really wanted to work in a radio station. And one of the things that we needed to do was do something called a needs and benefits analysis for the employer. We needed to find out what were things that, well, first, what were the tasks done in a small market radio station? And then what were things that Train could contribute in that scenario? And of course, we knew that from, from Discovery, trying to figure out her, her specific tasks. And then we were able to make the match for her to end up doing tasks related to reception, to the disc jockeys in the station, to the advertising, virtually save the, the advertising a specialist job in that the advertising person was great at sales and terrible at paperwork. So Trang ended up doing some of her paperwork and even the station manager had uh, tasks that became part of Trang's job. And, and again, if you just went in and said, you know, I'm here, I want to apply for a job, the, the, the personnel machine would just eat her up and spit her out. But instead, she gets to work in a dream job. And indeed, many people have dreams. Tony, for instance, the man with Williams syndrome, and he's, he just loves music. And, and he has a dream of being a musician. But what if we could get him close to, uh, very, very close to that, working with musicians, working in a place where musicians, as hard as that life is, musicians have to have a, a day job. So let's get, him, let's get him fixed up on a day job so he's actually got something to do. And... Um, and uh, in a, one of the oldest music stores in Fort Worth, he's, uh, he's been there just working away, doing all kinds of tasks that are improving the workplace within that context. One of my favorite stories is what happened in Discovery with Sal. 
Uh, Sal and his family live in a pretty tough area, South Central Los Angeles. And we were pretty con confused about what task Sal might offer at work. Sal is a man whose arms are restrained to his wheelchair, his legs are restrained, his whole body, you see him in a bolster here, and he does not generate any speech sound whatsoever. Nothing comes out. And the piece of paper you see in front of him, his mother uh, had laminated, that basically says, hi, my name is Sal. I can't speak, but I understand what you say. And then it goes on to say how Sal says yes and no. And, um, and it's kind of hard to think about, well, what task is he going to do at work if he can't move his arms, he can't move his legs, he can't speak? And his mother during discovery just told a, just a family story of, of going to get groceries and gang territory was she'd have to pass through two uh, street corners with gang members. So they had to always worry about the color of their clothing. But in the store, uh, she had never taken Sal shopping. She just shopped for him. And it, school was out and he had no job and he was just waiting. So she decided that she would take him shopping. And, and right at the end, and it was just a funny little story, she said, you know, I, I usually pull, I have this pull cart and I would ask for paper rather than plastic when they were bagging my groceries. And, uh, and for whatever reason this day, she said, I asked for plastic. And I realized that the plastic bags wouldn't sit in her, in her uh, little cart. And she looked at Sal and said, Sal, I mean, only a mother can do this. Sal, would you mind? And she started hanging the bags all over his wheelchair. Now, it's a power chair. And she laughed and said, when I was done, he looked like a Christmas tree. Well, that's a funny story. And it's just a family story. But folks, if you can deliver groceries through gang territory, you can deliver something in a workplace if you can find an employer who needs something delivered. So what we're saying here is, is that many of our ideas, many of our leads come from life, not from, not from some sophisticated but irrelevant test uh, that, that probably would say, I'm sorry, there's nothing for Sal to do. And one of the things that was so confusing about Catherine uh, Catherine's a young woman who, who was always wanting to serve coffee, and it was confusing to her and her, te her teacher and her mother uh, because both said, well, Catherine doesn't even like coffee. Well, she did like the aroma of coffee, but more than that, she liked hospitality, and that's really who Catherine is at her deepest, her inner person I've got here, that, that she just wanted to serve people. And so by helping her open the kiosk, this is her her own coffee cart, her, her own cell phone business in a, uh, in a community college that, that had no coffee for students. You know, a college without coffee as the ingredients of revolution. So, so she was really able to, to calm the waters at the, at the educational place. And not only that, have a very effective business of meeting people's needs. And it just fit with who she is as a person. So we're at a point right now that we are, uh, I've, I've finished in, looks like we've got about 17 or 18 minutes of time. And one of the things I'm going to do is to ask Beth uh, to rejoin. And uh, Beth, if you can read for me some of the questions that. And I see one from Jennifer here. Uh, are behaviors part of significant disability? They certainly can be, um, as um, as states make dis de determinations as to uh, what comprises a definition for disability. Behavior is often uh, the most challenging. Now, for uh, significant intellectual disability, uh, it would uh, behavior would often be paired with. Uh, with what's perceived to be significant intellectual disability might be paired with autism. If you had someone who simply had a significant behavioral issue without um, an intellectual disability, then it would be up to the state to determine if that's a definition they accept. But for most people, the answer is going to be yes. And customized employment, while it doesn't in and of itself resolve behavioral issues. We work with employers in 
what we call positive uh, disclosure. One of the things that's very important, I mean, just to give you a quick example from how we learned some of this stuff, I can remember uh, back nearly 20 years ago in, in uh, Connecticut, a woman came out of an institutional setting where uh, one of her behaviors of, of w when she would get frustrated, fatigued, or angered, she'd take all of her clothes off. I mean, all of her clothes off. And and yet by uh, and that's a that's a very embarrassing thing to deal with. But if you put that person on a job site and don't disclose that to an employer, and she ends up taking her clothes off, she's going to be fired summarily. But by having an employer understand the context that the behavior is occurring in, uh, actually had employers willing to deal with that. Now. Uh, we have this thing of conditions for success. If you take your clothes off, a condition for success is not to work around the public. But at the same time, it's not to work in a in a dark room with nobody else. So, uh, as as embarrassing it would as it would be for your coworkers to see without clothes on, if it means you don't get fired because people actually understand what might have happened, the same way a family member or maybe a good service provider has understood over the years, then, then the person might not be fired. And that's exactly what happened in the situation uh, that I'm discussing. So behavior can be a part of, of the disclosure and the difference. We don't go in saying, oh, this person is just perfect and there's no issue and you really shouldn't worry about anything. And then on the second day of work, some major behavior occurs they're going to get fired. So that's the that's the distinction. So Beth, do you have any other questions? I can read some if you don't. Mike, there are some other questions. Can you hear me now? I can. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I was talking earlier, but I don't think anyone could hear. So hopefully we fixed that now. So yes, there are some other questions. Um, Catherine had asked, um, what education background and training do the staff have who support these folks? Well, there's. Uh, let me be specific on my answer because I'm talking about customized is not a form of support. It's a form of facilitation. So I just want to be uh, exact on my uh, language. And uh, the what we have found, if we can provide uh, good training that's performance based. One of the things that MGNA is doing, for instance, we're doing performance based certification now. And we don't have any requirements for, uh, for academic le levels uh, on this. In other words, you don't have to have a degree. Uh, the, we work with many people who have uh, finished high school or maybe had a couple of years of of community college. Some people have a degrees and advanced degrees. But the point is these are their specific skills to be learned and we found that we can actually train those skills uh, in a performance-based certification manner that is uh, that, that's uh, economical, that no more than the cost of say community college courses and that systems can uh, choose to do this, can buy these uh, this training. Uh, one of the things that, of course, I'm speaking somewhat, uh, you know, from self-interest, being that I'm a consultant, but it's not likely that that people just seat of their pants pull this off well. Uh, so, but it's not a matter of of academic skills. It's just a matter of having the information. Uh, so I mean, it is fully possible, and family members have done it, and professionals have done it alike. Uh, direct service people of just being self-taught that is possible also uh, so there's a there's a skill set associated with this there's information at markgold.com that be sure and if you visit that website you put marcgold.com and there's a ton of free information not only on the certification that I'm talking about but also on um, uh, there's there's about 50 free articles uh, that cover all of the stuff on customized employment that we've talked about. 
Just look under publications. They're all free. You can download it and, um, and find a, a great deal of information. Okay, next. Thanks, Mike. And we do have in the web links, if you click on Mark Gold and Associates, you'll see um, you'll have the link to, um, to the website Mike's talking about. The next question, Mike, are adults are required to go through DVR before our community agency can start to pursue employment? Is this typical? You know, I, I require is an interesting word, and I need to tell you that because the act was is only a year and a half old, and because we're still waiting for final regulations, a lot of states are still getting their act together around customized employment. That that happens all the time when there's a new definition in the act. Um, so uh, realize that that even though it's the law of the land that there still can be frustration in accessing the service. My feeling is this, uh, you use the term require. Um, it's my feeling that VR should be the payer of first resort for customized because it is a pre-employment service. Most states are funding supported employment services, ongoing supported employment paying for job coaches through their Medicaid waiver and through their DD service that the most ideal way to pay for customized is through Voc Rehab because it is the service to get people jobs and they have only limited responsibility of supported. They do have responsibility in supported employment, but it is limited uh, to 18 to 24 months. So uh, with that, it, there are plenty of people who don't go to VR, but here's the problem. Let's say you started Discovery. Uh, a teacher started discovery without ever taking her students to VR. Uh, without a relationship with the VR counselor, you might run into significant resistance if you ask the VR counselor to pay, let's say, for job development support, uh, which they should pay for, especially for transition students now 18 to 21, and especially with the new uh, focus on uh, a school transition for VR within the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act. It's significantly uh, increased. So it's not an absolute requirement, but it's a, it's a very good idea and I strongly recommend it. Uh, I feel like that, that for years Voc Rehab has not dealt effectively with the group of people that I'm talking about. Uh, and supported employment was not necessarily what VR really wanted in its act. And now customized is probably not what it really wants. But we can get closures for VR counselors. It's a, it's a very pragmatic system. And this can work to get people jobs. It works for employers. It can work for funders. And it certainly works for the individual and their families. So give it a thought to try to go that route. OK, Beth? Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, next, how do I get my son to get a discovery review? Um, I'm not sure what he can contribute with his particular disability. Mm -hmm. and I guess yeah, and, and th th there's a rule of thumb that says the, the, the more we know about a person, the harder it is to do discovery. I mean, I... I'd like to think I could do discovery with my daughter. She would have never let me do it, uh, but but I would be the worst person in the world. So, I mean, I understand the difficulty in often seeing what's right in front of you. But it, it, if the if the person is of age to, to and, and this is something that Pete could find out for you in, in Colorado of uh, uh, having uh, VR services. Now, traditionally, they've they wanted the person to be 21, but, but I think you'll find under the new law that, that uh, people as young as 18 uh, can now sign up for VR. And it's going to mean going through their information, but it also says if they're going to say, well, we have to evaluate you, one of the things you have to do is arm yourself with information. We certainly don't have time in this short call to give you a course on that, but that information is available online. It's a, probably Pete could help you with it, and certainly your state disability rights people could help you 
to understand that which is legally and necessarily required and that which is just typically done. And a lot of states, and I wouldn't doubt that Colorado would be one, you'd find, no, we have to evaluate. And it's the proper response is, no, we want discovery. Well, we don't have anybody to do discovery. Well, now we get in that circular argument, but I know there are people trained in Colorado in discovery. I've, it's been a while, but I've trained many of them myself. And there's information on how to do it. And, uh, you know, it's up to the system to begin to develop if, if a determination of the individual strengths, needs, and interest is in the act, we want that determination. It's not a test, not an evaluation. So, but it, you're not done with advocacy. Those of you who, are, who have fought the hard fight as parents uh, to get good school services, they're really just beginning for access to adult services. I, I won't tell you it's easy, and I won't tell you it's guaranteed, but I will tell you it's possible. Beth, probably have time for one more. There is one more question, and yes, if you could address that relatively quickly. We are going to need to close in just a minute. The last question is, will the Mark Gold free articles help a parent talk with their human resources at their company for their children about customized employment? I think so. You know, we, we're not a parent support center, so, so our focus isn't to write that way. But I, I believe they would help. And you may have to dig a bit and, um, uh, to, to, to really get the language you need, but the information is there. And, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, focus like on the information from this webinar, there's in, there, we have six articles that we give away free on that website that takes the entire uh, gamut of, of the customized process, starting with what is customized, discovery, profile, plan, visual resume, and job development. They're all on there. So I think among those, if you read through those, and they're about 15, 16 pages each. So I mean, it's a piece of work. I think within that you'd pretty well understand. So Beth, I think that wraps it up for me and uh, want everybody to know I really appreciate the, your participation tonight. I hope this has been helpful for you and hopeful for you. And um, you, Beth, I'll turn much. it over to you. Um, I think you